Thank you very much. Senator Rubio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Newland, let me read you a quote here from the same individual. It's the General, General Philip Breedlove. He said, Russia has chosen to be an adversary and poses a long-term existential threat to the United States and to our European allies and partners. He goes on to say, Russia doesn't just want to change or challenge the agreed rules of the international order. It wants to rewrite them. Is that your assessment of the state of Russia today under Vladimir Putin as far as a role in the international uh, scene? Senator, I don't have a problem with that characterization at all. So then let me ask about uh, Ukraine. Uh, it, Roman Sohn, who's a Ukrainian activist, he wrote about Minsk, Minsk too. He said he called it a farce. And here's his quote. While Russia does nothing to implement the agreement, the U.S. and the EU are forcing Minsk too down the throat of Kiev and that Putin knows that it is much easier for the West to put pressure on Ukraine to accept bad terms than it is to forge a consensus on keeping the pressure, including sanctions on Russia, end quote. I seem to share those views given the fact that it appears that Russia is perfectly comfortable with what they view as a frozen conflict in the region. Uh, obviously, some of what they're doing in Syria is distracting attention. We don't talk about Ukraine around here nearly as much as we once did. Everyone's focused on the role they're playing in, in Syria, and I think part of the calculation Putin had was exactly that. But it is, in fact, a frozen situation, and I walked in late when uh, Senator Menendez was asking about this. But why is he wrong when he characterizes it as a farce? Why is he wrong when he characterizes it as a situation where no one is pressuring Russia to comply, but they know that the West and our European partners are pressuring Kiev, especially the Germans, to comply? Senator, I think the largest piece of, of leverage that we have on Russia is the sustainment over two years of, of deep and comprehensive sanctions across the U.S. and the EU countries, Japan, Canada, et cetera. Uh, so again, this is why we are advocating, because Minsk has not been implemented, that sanctions have to be rolled over again. We are uh, continuing to press, as I said uh, to, in response to Senator Shaheen's uh, point, that Ukraine cannot be asked to vote on the political decentralization pieces of Minsk until the prior actions that are demanded in Minsk, real uh, ceasefire, real access throughout Donbass for OSCE, cantonment of heavy weapons, has been implemented. So that is the frame that we are using. That's the frame that Germany and France are using. I think Ukraine does itself a service by being ready at, with text on an election law, being ready with special status to implement when those agreed conditions are met, but Russia has not, either itself or, or uh, with its clients in Donbass, gotten the security conditions met. So when you talk about rollover, you mean the extension of the existing framework. Why not increase sanctions? These are now violations of an agreement that they reached and they have not complied with. And I, I'm not, am I right in guessing or, or in stating that your argument is going to be that we, can, we don't want to go any further than our partners in Europe are willing to go, and they're not willing to do additional sanctions? Well, Senator, I would say I, I was quite gratified when the, when the G7 nations uh, that met in Japan just a couple of weeks ago made clear that we are ready uh, to increase sanctions if we need to. Uh, the United States, as you know, not only maintains the sanctions but does regular maintenance to them to ensure that they can't be circumvented. Uh, we've done that on two occasions, and we're prepared to do it again. It's could there an argument be met that this pain threshold is something Putin has willing to accept? It clearly has not uh, impacted his behavior. Or do you argue that the sanctions have impacted his behavior? Well, all I can tell you is we have deterred further land grabs in Ukraine, and that was a real risk when we first started with sanctions, that they would try to run all the way to Kiev and to, and, and to Kharkiv. I will tell you that Russians are openly talking now about the pain of sanctions, including when we work with them on the Minsk thing. Uh, so they know what it's going to take to get these sanctions uh, rolled back, and it's, it's their choice whether they want to do what's necessary. And what about Crimea? How come we no longer hear Crimea mentioned? Is it a de facto now, matter of fact? Is it something we've just accepted as reality, or does that continue to be a part of our conversations that Crimea should be returned rightfully? Senator, I mentioned Crimea here in my opening. Secretary mentions it every time he speaks publicly in, in Russia. We will maintain the Crimea sanctions, which are significant, both U.S. and E.U., until Crimea is returned rightfully to Ukraine. When they took over Crimea, there was a sense, and I thought, that it would be a boondoggle for the Russian government, that it would cost them a bunch of money to maintain that area. Uh, has it, in fact, 
turned out, other than the, the geostrategic advantage, do we have any sense as to how many resources they're having to put in to uphold and maintain this now as part of their national territory? Uh, it is our estimate that Russia is spending billions of rubles trying to maintain its, its foothold in Crimea. I think the, the most concerning factor, though, is that they are further militarizing Crimea. Dr. Carpenter might want to speak to that. Thank you. Sen well, I would just say that absolutely that Russia is militarizing Crimea. They've put in very sophisticated uh, A2, AD capabilities there since the start of the conflict. Thank you. Very good. Sen